Okay, it's, <clears throat> it's time. I, it's just a, a quick uh, announcement that um, if you did send in your DCF for feedback, you should have it back by now. I mean, the comments are minimalist. And uh, uh, if you get a chance, you know, I know the email I sent you was really long yesterday, but it's kind of, it gives you the template on how I approach to DCF, the things to look for. I'll actually you know, put it on online as a, as a page you can check online so that you don't have to keep going back to the email. But um, give, it, give it a shot because you have the capacity to, to self-diagnose your own DCFs at this point in time. So let me get started. Today, in our last session, if you remember, we were talking about pricing. And I thought I'd start today with a question about pricing. And this is something you're going to all face in a few weeks, maybe even a week. You've done a DCF valuation of your company, right? You found something about your company. It's undervalued, it's overvalued, whatever it is. The other part of your project, and I'd strongly suggest you get this out of the way as quickly as you can, is that you need to price your company. What does that mean? You pick a multiple, you pick comparables, you're going to be pricing your company. And what I'm going to give you in this start of the class test is actually a scenario that you might run into. So let's say you've done an intrinsic valuation of company. Let me call it Xyloft. You've come up with a value of ten dollars per share. The stock price is fifteen. So, what does the intrinsic valuation tell you? The stock is. Raja, your question. No, the audio quality was kind of choppy, but it's resolved itself. You know what? I will actually turn off my video because that might actually help. I've had this issue today. Yeah, it's, it seems to be fine now for the last few okay. seconds. So when you've done an intrinsic valuation, you come up with a value of 10, the stock is trading at 15. Stock is clearly overvalued, right? Then you do a pricing of the company by looking at a multiple and comparables, P ratio and software companies. You come up with a value of $20 per share. So you pull it in two different directions, right? Your intrinsic valuation says it's un it gives you the conclusion it's overvalued, the pricing says it's undervalued. I'm gonna read a few statements about what you've just found. Can you tell me which of these you would most like, most think, think, which of these statements you think best reflects what you've just found? Maybe your conclusion is the stock is undervalued because the price is greater than the, is, is actually less than the relative value. It's overvalued if you think about an intrinsic standpoint. Maybe you'll average the two numbers up, right? 10 and 20, average it out, you come up with exactly 15. Maybe it's perfectly valued if you take the average. Maybe the stock is both over and undervalued. So how can the two both coexist? We're gonna talk about whether that can happen or none of the above. So is it undervalued, overvalued, correctly valued, both over and undervalued? Anybody want to give, give it a shot? Rodrigo, what do you think? Is it overvalued, undervalued, correctly valued, both over and undervalued? Uh, I, I think it's none because, I mean, the market might be assigning a high price, but if, if according to your, your assumptions, you could still be right. But that kind of leaves you in a no man's land, right? So you, kind of, you have to make a decision. So the question I'm asking is, push came to shove, where would that decision put you? Is it yeah, maybe I'll, I'll choose more my valuation. Okay, so you're saying you'd believe the intrinsic value, you'd go with it. But how do you yeah. explain this divergence? Let's say you did the pricing right and you did the intrinsic valuation right. How can the two approaches be giving you such divergent conclusions about a stock? Louis, you want to try? Like momentum or market sentiment? Okay, so when I said the stock is overvalued on an intrinsic value basis, here's the statement I'm making. Given the cash flows, growth, and risk of the company, I don't think the company is worth $15, right? But when I do pricing, what's the statement I'm making? Given how the market is pricing other software companies, I think the stock is worth $20. You know what? Those statements can both coexist. They could both be right. In intrinsic valuation, you're making a statement about absolute value. In pricing, you're making a statement about relative value. Doesn't make one better than the other, they're just different statements. In fact, today when we, st uh, uh, to start the class, I'm gonna kind of go back to my Amazon valuation that I did. Remember that uh, I valued Amazon with the DCF model in January, 2000. 
I came up with a value of $35 per share and the stock was trading at 84. And I said, the stock is overvalued. I actually tried to price Amazon at exactly the same time. So to price Amazon, what do I need to do? I need to find comparable companies. And for better or worse, I called, I looked at all dot-com companies and I looked at revenue multiples. You know why I used revenue multiples? Desperation, every one of the, I think every one of these companies except for AOL was losing money. If you're losing money, no choice but to use revenue multiples. I actually use price to sales. I probably used EV to sales, but no, in hindsight that's in 2020. I use price to sales and net margin. Remember in every example I've, I did in the last class, beverage, banks, I picked a multiple and a, com and, a, and a control variable and it did really well at explaining differences on that multiple, right? Return on equity, price to book, you know, price to sales with margins of grocery stores. When I tried this for dot-com stocks, I knew I was in trouble. You see why? When you look at this plot, it's a scatter plot, and you try to find a relationship between price to sales and margin, this looks like a shotgun blast. Right? The points are all over the place. Undaunted, I decided to run a regression anyway to see what I would find, no surprise. When I tried to regress price to sales against net margin for dot-com stock, the R squared I got was close to zero. Even scarier, if you look at the coefficient of net margin, every 1% increase in the net margin actually made my price to sales ratio lower. So if you read this right, the more negative your net margin, the higher your price to sales ratio. If any of you are valuing electric companies, and I know you are because at least seven or eight people in this class are valuing NEO, and you look at other electric car companies, you're gonna run into this issue. You value a ride-sharing company, they're all losing money. Artificial intelligent companies, all losing money. You're gonna see what you saw with Amazon play out. And you can say, what do I do now? So I'm gonna give you a couple of ways you can use to get out of this problem. So you're in a sector, you picked a multiple and comparables, and there seems to be no relationship based. I mean, you were expecting price to book and return. It's not working here. With Amazon, here's the first thing I tried. I said, look, when I look at Amazon in 2000, nobody's buying Amazon for the profits they made last year. Nobody's buying any dot-com stock for the profits they made last year. I'm gonna come up with, three, with a different way of explaining pricing. And I'm gonna throw three hypotheses at you about that might explain price to sales ratios across, across dot-com companies. And you tell me what you think about these hypotheses. The first is I argue that as revenues go up, the price to sales ratio is gonna come down. In other words, it's easy to trade at a hundred times revenues. If you're a million dollar company, it's gonna get more difficult to do that if you have a billion dollars in revenues. So I expect the price to sales ratio to get smaller as revenues increase. Second, I said, I know there's growth, but the growth is in revenues. Higher revenue growth is better than lower revenue growth. Higher revenue growth companies should trade at higher multiples of revenues. And third, I said, many of these companies won't make it. They're money losing companies. But one reason they will not make it is they will run out of cash. So if I can somehow find companies with more cash, they, will, they have a better chance of survival. So I looked at how much cash the companies had as a fortune of revenue. I re-ran the regression. The R squared I got was about 32%. Now, if this were a statistics class, as I noted, 32% is a terrible R squared. But in this particular sector, if I can explain 32% of what's going on, I'm probably going to, this is about as, as good as it gets. And then I looked at the coefficients and here's what I found. They all were consistent with what I expected. Higher revenue companies have lower price to sales ratios, which makes sense. Scaling up, your multiple goes down. Higher revenue growth companies have higher price to sales ratios, which again makes sense. And the more cash these companies have as a person of revenues, the higher my price to sales ratio. I have a regression that explains pricing across dot-com stocks based on things I think should matter. In fact, I plugged in the numbers for Amazon into that regression. I got a predicted price to sales ratio of 30.4. You're saying, what am I gonna do with that? That was actually higher than their actual price to sales ratio. Based on the pricing, Amazon looks cheap. But again, think of the different statements, right? When I did a discounted cash flow valuation of Amazon, what was I saying? Based on its cash flows, growth and risk, Amazon is overvalued. Here, what I'm saying is given how other dot-com stocks are being priced, Amazon is actually a bargain. And a year later, I'd have been right on both dimensions because here's what happened. 
Over the following year, the stock dropped 80%. So I can point to my DCO and say, hey, look, I told you so. I thought the stock was overvalued. But it dropped by only 80%. You say, what do you mean only 80%? You know what the rest of the dot-com sector did? It dropped 92%. The pricing is vindicated. It dropped by less than the sector. So when you price your stock, you're asking and answering a different question about your stock than when you do an intrinsic valuation. It's entirely possible you could get a very different answer here because of the question you frame. Any questions? So that's the first choice is abandon the traditional metrics and think about what else will work in this sector. And maybe if you can find a regression that works, you're all set. Here's the second choice. One reason you often have trouble applying pricing to young companies is there's not much there. You know what I mean by not much there? Revenues are small, you're losing money. One thing you could do is rather than try to price the company based on this year's numbers, why not price it based on what your revenues will be in year five or 10? This is called a forward multiple. So rather than apply the multiple to this year's revenues, you apply it to year five revenues or year 10. Trust me, this is not additional work. You've already done the DCF. You got your predicted revenues in year 10, your predicted earnings in year 10. What if you applied the multiple to that number? So let me do, let me do a what if. Let's suppose you're valuing a tiny electric car company. Let's you know what NEO's revenue is right now. Let's say 2 billion. But you expect them to be 30 billion in year five because you expect the company to grow. And what if you believe that the correct multiple to apply in revenues based on your research is four times revenues? You with me so far? I go to year five, I've got 30 billion in revenues, four times 30 billion is 120 billion. That is my forward value for NEO. But I want the value today because I'm buying the stock today. So what's left to do? I've got to discount the 120 million back five years. Don't just compare the price today to the 120 billion. That's not fair. You got to bring it back to today. There's many a slip between the cup and the lip. Those of you valuing young companies, if you get a chance, revisit your own DCF. Look at how big your terminal value is. It's going to be huge relative to the value you gave me today. So what happened? Lots of cuts between what that terminal value is and what you get today. To illustrate how much you lose as you go from the terminal year back to today. I'm going to take you back to one of the very first valuations I did of Tesla. So I think 2013, I valued Tesla at about 8 billion. It shows you how much my valuations have shifted over time. But my discounted cash flow valuation actually had a terminal value of Tesla of 68 billion. I remember getting a bunch of emails asking, how if your terminal value is 68 billion, is your value only 8 billion today? So I actually wrote a post explaining how I got from the $68 billion terminal value back to today. I'm going to take it a step at a time. The 68.2 billion is 10 years from now. If you discount it back even at the risk-free rate, which is kind of minimalist discounting, that becomes 52 billion. So if all I did was discount at the risk-free rate, 68 billion, I'd lose about 16 billion. If I discount back at the cost of capital, which is a risk-adjusted number, it drops to 27.8 billion. So just discounting, my 68 billion becomes 28 billion. That's why I emphasize, don't forget to bring it back to today. The company had negative cash flows for the first five years, and that drains the value. If I bring those negative cash flows in, the 28 billion becomes 12.8 billion. Then if I net out debt and add cash, the value that I get is 8 billion. So that big terminal value can very quickly melt away as you factor in discounting and negative cash flows. And that's why it's so dangerous attaching a forward multiple, coming up with a number and acting as if that's what you should be paying today. Any questions on forward multiples? So if you have a young company or a very small company, it's still evolving, let it evolve on your spreadsheet. Come up with numbers that are more substantive five or 10 years from now. Use that as your basis for coming up with the value. And then remember to bring it back to today at the minimum to estimate what the pricing would be today. One final example, and then we'll uh, put, put pricing individual companies to rest. In 2013, when Twitter went public, I valued Twitter. But then I said, look, I'd also like to price the company. So to price the company, here's what I did. I went and collected data on publicly traded social media companies in 2013. So there's the list. Facebook, LinkedIn, Pandora, Groupon. 
these are all companies that draw their value. They're very different businesses, but they draw their value from users. I collected the market cap of every company and some financial numbers, enterprise value, revenues, EBITDA, and net income. But I also was able to find the number of users that each company had in, the, in, the, in this column. So Facebook at 1.23 billion, Yelp at 120 million, but you can see the numbers vary across. I computed a bunch of multiples, enterprise value to revenue, enterprise value to EBITDA, PE, those are all standard multiples. You can see how many I lose with PE ratio. But I also divided the enterprise value by the number of users. See, what is that going to tell me? Well, if I value these companies based on the number of users, I'm paying about $130 per user for Facebook, but I'm paying only $21 per user for Trulia. Now, I wanted to decide which of these multiples I should use to price Twitter. And rather than me make the judgment, I decided to let my statistics help me out. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to see what variable the market seems to be using to come up with a pricing for each company. So what I did was I took the market cap and enterprise value and looked to see how correlated they were with revenues, EBITDA, net income, and number of users. Take a look at that first column, right? If you look at the last four correlations, the highest correlation by far with any variable is with number of users. In 2013, you know how markets are pricing social media companies? Based on number of users. You're saying that doesn't make sense. When you do pricing, it's not your job or my job to tell the market it doesn't make sense. You just take the market as a given. Roughly speaking, the market was paying about $100 per user. If you look at the previous page, 97.41 per user in this business. You want to do a pricing of Twitter? Let's go. They had 240 million users at the time they went public. The market's paying $100 per user. Help me out here. If I were pricing Twitter, I'd take 240 million multiplied by 100, I get $24 billion. That's my pricing of Twitter. That came awfully close to what the actual price was in the IPO day. Don't make pricing more sophisticated and complicated than it has to be. Because all you're doing is taking what the market does and applying it to your company to come up with the pricing. Joe? Hey, Professor. So how are you finding the correlation here? What values are you using? Just take these values right here, right? So there's a market cap, and you just do a correlation against EBITDA. So if, you were, if you're using a statistics package, there's your, the, the, it's just basically these, these variables. I see. All right. Thank you. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Now, so far though, every example I've used, I've used a sector, right? Beverages, banks, you know, telecom companies. But in each case, I talked about how to control for differences, differences in growth, differences in risk. But if you can control for differences in growth and risk and cash flows, I have a question, why do we stay sector focused? Why can't I compare Coca-Cola to every company in the market? You see, you can't, you can't do that, says who? Think of what you gain when you go across the market. Your sample size gets much, much bigger. Of course, the companies are more diverse, but as long as I can control for differences, I now have a much bigger sample size. At the start of every year, for the last 30 years with US stocks and the last 15 with global stocks, here's what I've done. I've computed every conceivable multiple for, for every company, price earnings, EV to EBITDA, EV to invested capital, price to bond. And then I run market-wide regressions. Let me explain what, what that means. If I took all US stocks as a start of 2021, every publicly traded US company, I compute the price earnings ratio for every company, the growth rates for every company. And I put a scatter plot, this is what it looks like. It looks like a mess, right? That's because there are 2000 companies in my sample. So there are 2000 little dots. And the conventional wisdom is high growth companies of higher PE ratios. I have good news, the conventional wisdom is right because if I fit a line through, it is in fact positive. Higher growth companies tend to have higher PE ratios. But you see what the bad news is? There's a lot of noise around this, this relationship. It's not as if every point is on the line, you can see many of them, which means there are some high growth companies with low PE ratios and low growth companies with high PE ratios. But I said, you know what? I'm gonna to try to explain differences in PE ratios across all US companies using a regression. 
Same tool we use, but here it's much more critical because I have 2000 companies in my sample. I take the PE ratio for every company. I take the payout, paid and growth for a company. So think of this as a big Excel spreadsheet. PE ratio in the first column, beta, growth and payout. You think, why do you pick those three? You know why I picked beta, growth and payout? If you go back a couple of sessions, when I talked about what drives PE ratios, remember I went back to a dividend discount model and did some algebra? And the three variables that came out were the cost of equity, the growth rate, and the payout ratio. This is not a kitchen sink regression. You know what a kitchen sink regression is? We've all been guilty of it in statistics classes, right? In a kitchen sink regression, your objective is to throw whatever you can to the regression to make the R squared go higher. That's not my objective. It's to throw the variables that should matter. The R squared I get is decent. It's about 40%. That's about as good as I'm gonna get looking across the entire market. Let's read the output from the regression. There's a constant, that's the intercept, 4.1. Every 1% increase in P payout ratios increases my PE ratio, that makes sense. Every increase in beta one increases my PE ratio. That actually doesn't make sense. The sign should be negative, right? Higher risk companies are supposed to have lower PE ratios, but in this regression, for some reason, they have higher PE ratios. We'll come back and talk about why that might be happening. And finally, higher growth companies have higher PE ratios. Every 1% increase in my growth rate increases my PE ratio by 2.5. Now, of course, this is a regression, so I shouldn't forget my statistics. Let's start with the standard statistical caveats, right? I've run a linear regression and you say, what if there are non-linearities? We'll come back and talk about it. In this particular case, I checked and it wasn't a particular problem, but we'll see when it's a problem. The second is that coefficient you get for price earnings and growth is at a point in time. If the market shifts over the next three months, the regression will stop working, which means the regression constantly has to be updated. And thirdly, I don't know whether you remember in statistics, when you run a regression, your independent variables are supposed to be uncorrelated with each other. We talked about this a little bit in the last slides. If they're correlated, you have what's called multicollinearity. And in finance, it's almost impossible to find independent variables that are uncorrelated with each other. Think about it. If I throw growth, payout, and risk into the same regression, in what universe are you going to find no correlation between the two? High growth companies will tend to have low payout ratios and high risk. It's the nature of the beast. So I'm going to give you some pragmatic advice. Whenever you run a regression, like the one I've run, first thing to check is the T-statistics, right? So take a look at the T-statistics I got two pages ago, and you can already see that beta is a T-statistic of 0.63. You're saying, so what? I mean, I, I, I hate to kind of throw an artificial rule, but if your T-statistic is less than one, you're adding noise by throwing this variable in. So if you have a statistically insignificant variable, just remove it. Don't say it should matter, it has to be in there. There's no should or has in here. If it doesn't make a difference, remove it. Statistically insignificant variables have no place in your regression. Second, so what I did actually here is I took beta out. And when I took beta out, I get a regression with only payout and growth rate. Much better regression in my view than the regression you saw. Even though the R squared drops marginally, it's a much more robust regression. The variables are both statistically significant. Second, once in a while when you run this regression, the constant, the intercept can be a negative number. In typical traditional statistics, it's not a big deal. But when you're trying to predict PE ratios, a negative intercept can sometimes get in the way. And here's why. If you have a big enough negative intercept, your predicted PE can be negative. And of course, PEs can't be negative. But an easy way around this, if you have a negative intercept, you're using Minitab or whatever statistics package, most statistics packages, you can actually run your regression without a constant. It forces the regression through the origin. And when you do that, you run a regression with no intercept and just the variables that matter. Not an issue this year, but in 2019, when I ran the regression, I had a negative intercept with my PE ratio, I removed it. So this is a statistical exercise. It's not a financial theory exercise. 
And don't worry about the multicollinearity. As I said, it's always going to be there. Don't let it bedevil your forecast. You can still use the overall regression. You can see the multicollinearity. And here's how you can tell. If this were a perfect regression, you know what should be true about the correlations of the one? The correlations between your independent variables should all be zero. And they're not. High growth companies tend to have high pay, no, tend to have much lower payout ratios, which makes sense and tend to be riskier. You tend to find correlations. Those correlations are always going to be there. It's not worth the trouble trying to wrestle with multicollinearity. Your regression can still be used for predictions, but your coefficients can sometimes have the wrong sign. Remember beta had a positive rather than a negative sign? It's because the computer got really confused. High beta companies tend to have high growth rates. After a while, the computer doesn't know whether beta measures risk or whether it measures growth. So don't read too much into the coefficients and you can still use the regression. You think use in what sense? Regression without the beta that you saw, this was from two pages ago. This, this regression looks like as follows. Basically, it's, there's the intercept, there's the payout and the growth rate. Let's suppose I came to you with a company. Excuse, let's, go, let's say I came to you with Disney. And I said, look, can you give me a very quick judgment on whether Disney is underpriced or overpriced? You have two minutes to do this. Here's what I would do. Take the growth rate for Disney, plug it in where the growth rate goes. Take the payout ratio. So you're going to get 5.91 plus 17.10 times 0.20 plus 228.40 times 0.15. You get a predicted PE for Disney of about 43. You think, what does that even mean? Given how the market is pricing other stocks right now, I would expect Disney to trade at 43 times earnings. It's actually trading at 35 times earnings. What does that mean? Based on this regression, Disney is underpriced. It's underpriced by about 20%. So if you want to invest based on pricing, you would buy Disney. In fact, you can use this regression to get predicted P's for every stock in the market, right? You can tell me the 50 most underpriced, the 50 most overpriced based on the regression. And then you could run a hedge fund, buy the 50 most underpriced, sell the 50 most overpriced and hope and pray they converge back on the regression. When you hear about quant investing, that's what quant investors do. This is a very simplistic version of quant investing, but they take the data and they try to extract from the data what stocks are being mispriced, and they hope and pray that the mispricing disappears. Any questions on the PE regression? So watch out for that negative intercept. Don't leave variables in there with, with, which are statistically insignificant, and use the regression as a basis for predicting pricing for individual companies. Nick? Yeah. Uh, my question is like um, it, on your point you just made about quants, right? But don't quants have this huge advantage on pricing because they have order flow data? Yeah, it, to the extent. I don't know how huge it is because if you have 10 quants with the order flow data, huge relative to who, right? Okay. You know, so it, it, it's the old, the old story about, you know, it depends on who you trade, but they might have an advantage over you and I, but they don't have an advantage over the next quant that they're trading against. That's why high frequency trading is now kind of a neutral or a negative sum game. People don't make money because they're trading it. But you know how you can get caught in the whipsaw, right? If you try to do in frequency trade, high frequency trading, or I did, we're going to get whipsawed because we're trying to enter a game where we don't belong. So the lesson from that is don't trade frequently. Don't try to do things based on order flow because you, these are places where you don't have an advantage. Yes, thank you, Professor. So one of the things I keep track of is that if you, if you think about the coefficient of regression, 2.28, I've kept track of that number now for almost 20 plus years. You know what it tells me? It tells me how much the market is willing to pay for growth. When that number is a high number, the market loves growth. When that number is a low number, the market doesn't care much for growth. Let's go back all the way to January 2000, peak of the dot-com boom. The market was paying 2.10 for every 1% growth, paying a high price and charging very little for risk. Think about it, if you're a high growth firm and I'm paying a high amount for growth and not charging very much for risk, you're in Nirvana. That was the dot-com boom. And you got the correction, but over time that number has gone up and down. 
now we're at the start of 2021, 2.28 is actually close to the, closer to the highest numbers I've seen over the last 21 years and the lowest. So the market is paying a high price for growth. The equity risk premium of 4.72% is actually a little lower than the historic norm over the last 20 years. The market's paying a high price for growth. It's not charging as much as it used to for risk. Is it any surprise that growth companies are doing so well in this market? The price of growth and risk are set by the market and those numbers shift over time. By using the regression, you can get a sense of what's happening to those numbers. So that's PE ratio. I'm gonna use one other multiple before I kind of put this to rest. And I'm going to do this to illustrate a statistical point because I've talked about linear, linear, linear all through and I've kind of added this caveat. So I wanted to run a regression on peg ratios. If you remember, the drivers of peg ratios are growth, payout, and risk, just like PE ratios. So before I run the regression, I do this almost standard practice. I run a scatter plot. So basically I did a scatter plot. Scatter plot of peg against growth. I knew I was in trouble because if you look at this graph and I might be reaching, it looks like it's not linear, right? If you look at it, it's all, you know, there's, there's, there's a curve on it. You think, what do I do? I'll tell you what tends to work 90% of the time and I'm gonna to go to it first. I took the log of the growth rate. So basically take a look at these two, two scatter plots. The first looks at peg versus growth. The second looks at peg versus log of growth. Maybe I'm imagining it but this looks more linear than the previous chart, doesn't it? No? In other words, if I run a regression of peg ratio, here's what I'm gonna do. Instead of using the growth rate as my variable, I'm gonna use the natural log of the growth. It's almost magical. It doesn't take away the noise in the regression. My R squared is still low, but that has nothing to do with nonlinearity. It comes from the fact that I cannot explain a whole lot of peg ratios with growth rates in 2021. If you're having trouble with the regression, try the natural log. Don't use the log based 10, natural log of, your, of whatever variable is giving you trouble. But to figure out which variable it is, do the scatter plots on each variable separately against your independent variable. I'm sorry, your dependent variable. If you get a chance, look at the valuation tools webcast from last week, because it's, it's basically a webcast about how do I know whether something is linear or non-linear, because then allows me to adjust my regression accordingly. How would I use this regression? You give me Disney, you give me the growth rate, the payout ratio, the beta. I can tell you what the predicted peg ratio should be for Disney given those characteristics. So it started 2021. This actually takes me more time than most of my other data analysis. I do, I think, seven different multiples, P, PEG ratios, EV to EBITDA, EV to invested capital, price to book, EV to sales. And then I run regressions. I run regressions by group. I do the US companies, I do European companies, emerging market companies, you know, Australian, New Zealand, Canada, Canadian companies, Japanese companies. And then I run a global regression of all companies around. And I put each multiple on a page so you can see what they share in common. So this is actually the page for PE ratios for US, European, Japanese, emerging. So it's the same three variables everywhere. The coefficients obviously are different in different parts of the world. You think? Which one should I use? Let's say you're pricing a Japanese company, Toyota. You might say, look, I want to look at it against other Japanese stocks. You can plug it into the Japanese regression, get a predicted PE for Toyota. Then you can say, you know what? I'd like to know how Toyota is being priced against global companies. You can take the global regression and plug it in. It's not an either or, you can do both. You get different pricing, the different regressions, but it allows you to then say, what is the pricing of my company given how the market is pricing other companies? In fact, I, I would bore you with it, but basically I do the same thing with peg ratios. Again, same three variables. One thing you notice about PE ratios, we look across regions, I had the best with US, I did the best with US stocks, highest R squared. And the worst I think were European companies at the start of 2021. You think that's because US stocks are better. Well, not necessarily. When I did peg ratios, guess which market I was best able to explain differences? It was Japan. There's no one multiple that, no, there's no one region of the world that dominates in every multiple and no one multiple that works in every region. Which means if you're going across the world, you might have to have your toolkit open and say, look, in this part of the world, PE ratio works best. 
in this part of the world price to book works best and let the data guide you on what your best choice is. With price to book, <clears throat> beta payout, earn, growth and earnings per share, return equity. In every part of the world, that's a dominant variable. And the R squares tend to get much better than you do with PE ratios. EV to EBITDA, tax rate shows up. Why? Because EBITDA is a pre-tax number. Again, with pricing, what you're doing is you're going back to the fundamentals to derive the variables that matter, and you're using the data to come up with what that relationship looks like in pretty much every part of the world. EV to sales, you see margin pop up. In sum, I think if you count all six multiples, I have a total of 36 different market regressions. Now, when you have to pick your company and decide to price your company against the market, which is one aspect of your project, I'm not expecting to run a market regression that's way too much work for what this class involves. I'm okay with you picking one of my market regressions and using it in your company. Just pick the one that you think best fits your company, whether you want to use the global or the regional, whether you want to use EV to sales or EV to invested capital or price to book. I'm going to leave that choice to you. But at least you have all of the regressions at your back and call, you can use them in whatever context you want to. Any questions about those market regressions? Nick? Yeah, I just, um, it's a, it should like, a, um, have you ever run this for like Israeli companies? Like, do, do you know which one? I've is done it, well, I think that I would, you know, you could run in, in smaller markets, it's actually easier than bigger markets, right? I don't have a 2021 update. You can pick just Brazilian companies, just Israeli companies, just Indian companies. And if it's a very small market, I'd be cautious. So I wouldn't do it on the Portuguese market, which is only 80 companies, but Israel can do. There are enough companies in there that you can run a regression. And the multiple that you should use in Israel, how do you decide? Run all yeah. seven, pick the one with the highest R squared. Pick the one that you can best explain. This is pragmatic. It's not driven by theory. There's no best multiple that works around the world. You get to make that choice too. Professor, do you, do, what do you advise, for example, to, to run the multivariate regression and pick the one with the largest R squared, right? Not, not that's right. that's what I would do, regression. the highest R squared. Okay. No. Yeah. And we know what variables you should do with every, every multiple. Price to book, it should be, you know, beta growth, payout, and return equity. So pick the variables that matter, run the regressions, and with capital IQ, it's actually very easy to do. Thank you, Professor. So when you get to this stage on your project, which I hope you get it out of the way because this shouldn't take much time. You have the choices you will face. So you're sitting there with your company saying, I want to price my company. First, you have to decide whether you want to use enterprise value, equity value, firm value, the denominator. And here's what's going to drive that choice. I know some of you, are valuing banks, insurance companies, investment banks. If you're doing a financial service company, stick with an equity multiple. Don't even play games with enterprise value. It should be an equity multiple, price earnings, price to book. If you have a sector which is non-financial and the debt ratios are widely different across companies, some have no debt, some have a lot of debt, use enterprise value multiples. It's very dangerous comparing equity multiples across companies when leverage is widely different across companies. So that's going to be your first choice, equity and enterprise value. Second, you have to choose a scaling variable. Are you going to scale to revenues, earnings, book value, invested capital? Think of all the choices. I'll make it easy. Let's suppose you're in a sector with 20 companies and 16 are losing money. You know what you should definitely not use? An earnings multiple. Because if you use an earnings multiple, you're going to end up with four companies in your sample. You can use a revenue multiple because you should have revenues for all 20 companies. Or if you have book value and it means something in this sector, you can use a book value multiple. It's pragmatic. It's you want to make sure you don't lose half, two thirds of your sample. Third, you have to decide for that variable you pick, whether it's revenues or earnings, what timing for the variable you want to use. You can divide by earnings in the last four quarters, trailing PE, forward PE, saying, or earnings in the year 2025. Which is the right one? Again, there is no right one. There's the one that best explains differences. And once you've found it, stick with it for every company in your sample. So if you decide to go with forward earnings for one company, you have to do forward earnings for all of them. And finally, you have to pick your peer group. 
right? So you go to S&P Capital IQ, initially you might say, I've been Israeli software companies, and we talked about Israel, I'm going to look at only other Israeli software companies. If you get 25, you're done, right? You have enough companies, but if you get only six, you say, that's not enough. You then have to decide how you're going to expand your sample. You might say, look, you know, I'm going to say these are enterprise software companies, but rather than look at only Israeli companies, I'm going to look at global enterprise software companies. After all, most Israeli software companies compete on a global market. They're not just selling to Israeli companies. So you want to make sure you get enough companies come through. So you can start geographically and you can add criteria, but every time you add a criteria, your sample is going to get smaller. You want enough companies in here for you to be able to make that judgment. So we've talked about pricing. And as you can see, pricing is data. It's data-driven, it's statistics. So I'm gonna say a couple of propositions about pricing before we put it to rest. One is when based on a pricing, when you tell me something is cheap or expensive, you made a qualified statement. You know what I mean by a qualified statement? You tell me something is cheap, you're saying it's cheap relative to these other companies are compared to. Anybody over six feet, uh, in this in this class, I mean, uh, anybody who's really tall. I don't know, Park. How tall are you? I'm not really tall, but six foot one. Six foot one. And when you meet with your family, are you usually the tallest person in the room? Yes. Yeah. So if I say, "Are you tall relative to your family?" But let's say you go to um, an NBA players summit. You're going to feel really short, right? It's your height doesn't change. It's who you compare yourself to. That's what pricing is. Depending on who you price your company against, you can get very different judgments because it's a relative statement. So you might not feel fat if you hang out with people of 400 pound plus all the time. I watch this show called My 600 Pound Life. I do it just, it's, it's one of the... It, it's this insanely crazy show, but I feel really thin after I watch that show because as a relative to that person, I'm always going to feel thin. Pricing is that way, it's a relative statement. And second, when you do pricing, you got to let go of this notion that you can find a perfect comparable company because no matter how careful you are about picking your peer group, there are always going to be differences in growth and cash flows and risk. And I suggest one tool you can use to control for this difference, which is regressions. If you don't like regressions, I'm perfectly okay with it. But you got to come up with a different tool for controlling for differences because those differences are not going to go away just because you don't like statistics. So let's review four step process to understanding multiple. Start by defining the multiple. Make sure it's consistently defined, uniformly estimated. Describe the multiple. What's high, what's low should be driven by the data, no rules of thumb. Analyze the multiple. If it's an equity multiple, go back to a dividend discount model and very quickly you can isolate the variables that drive that multiple. If it's an enterprise value multiple, go to an enterprise value equation and you can very quickly tell me what the variables are that control that multiple. Define, describe, analyze, and only then should you apply. Any questions about pricing, any aspect of pricing? I'm going to take a detour. Let me explain what I mean by a detour. And early, at the start of this class, I said there are three ways you can value a company. You can do an intrinsic valuation, you can do a pricing, or you can do a real options, a contingent claim valuation. I don't know any of you, uh, I don't think any of you brought this as an alternative, but usually when I do this it, with a group of appraisers, one of them will put up their hand and say, what about asset-based valuation? What about some of the parts valuation? How come you're not counting those? I'm going to take a detour and talk about why when you do an asset-based valuation, you don't have a fourth approach. You're just applying one of the existing approaches. You know what I mean by asset-based valuation? Let's say I came to you with Coca-Cola as a company. The way we value Coca-Cola is we look at the collective earnings and cash flows of the company. We discount it back. We come up with a value for the company. But if you take Coca-Cola, could you value it in pieces? You could value the sodas, the water, the ge geography. So in other words, you could take a company and value each piece of the company separately and then add them all up. That's what an asset-based valuation does. It values individual assets owned by a company or individual businesses. You're saying, why would I ever need to do that? 
Why can't I just stick with what we know, value the whole company? Well, there are three, three different missions where asset-based valuation might be acquired. The first is, let's suppose I have a company that I plan to liquidate. I have eight buildings that I own. They're rental buildings. I call you in. What does liquidation mean? What are you going to do? You're going to sell each building and get the best price you can, right? You know what your job is? Is to value each building separately and add up those values. There's no going concern here. In liquidation valuation, you have to value the assets because you have to sell the assets to collect the liquidation value. Second, I hope none of you are planning to become accountants in the long term, but if you did, the big push in accounting now is fair value accounting. What is fair value accounting required to do? Take every piece of the company and value it separately. Brand name, you know, customer list. In other words, fair value accounting, you're often required to value individual pieces of the company separately. And there's a third context in which you might be required to value the pieces. Let's say you end up at Pershing Square. You know, who, who, you know, who owns Pershing Square? It's Bill Ackman, activist investor. And one of the things Bill has done off and on over the last 25 years is he sometimes targeted multi-business companies for an acquisition. Now, what's his plan? It's to acquire the company and break it up into pieces because his belief is this company has become inefficient in these multiple businesses. It's called a sum of the parts valuation. His so argument is the sum of the parts is worth more than the overall company. So in each of these, you're trying to value individual assets rather than the company. Now, don't get me wrong. Everything we've talked about in the context of discounted cash flow valuation can be applied here, but you've got to be a little creative. So let's think about how you can value the sum of each part of a company. One is you can do an intrinsic valuation of each part. If you can get the cash flows, growth, and risk for each part, you can value each part separately. The second is you can do a pricing of each part. Remember those eight buildings that I owned and I wanted to do a liquidation valuation? You can see what I get for each building. That's a pricing of each part. Or maybe you trust accountants more than I do, in which case you can take the book value of each part and say that's a value of each part. Intrinsic valuation. Now do you see why asset-based valuation is not a different approach to valuation? It applies, takes one of the existing approaches, intrinsic value or pricing, and applies it on each asset. Now, if you're ever asked to do an asset-based valuation of a company, pray and hope it's a company where the assets are separable. You know what I mean by separable? That company with eight buildings, rental buildings. Each building can be valued separately because each building is a standalone asset with its own earnings and its own cash flows. If I asked you to do a sum of the parts valuation of Disney, think of how much of a nightmare it's going to be. And here's why. Disney theme parks derives a big chunk of its value from how well the movies do, right? Disney streaming, if you think about the biggest hits, Mandalorian, you know, you know right now the, you know, What's the newest one that came out of? Is it? At least they have at least Falcon and uh, the, the Falcon show is the newest show. If you think about streaming, a big chunk of streaming's value is tied to their movie business. You see why it's going to be difficult to value each piece separately because they're all tied together. So if you have separable assets, much more easy to do it. If those assets have their own earnings and cash flows, your life got a lot simpler. And if you're trying to price each part, It'd be nice if each part had comparable assets or companies out there that were actually being priced. In other words, if I wanted to price the streaming business at Disney, it'd be nice to be able to use Netflix's multiples to apply on Disney. So let's think about each of these contexts, what your task is going to look like. Now, I don't know where you're going to end up, what job you're going to do, but let's say you end up in a company that does a lot of liquidation valuation. Remember what your mission is. In liquidation valuation, you want to sell each piece of the company today and see what you can get. You think you should be valuing these pieces or pricing these pieces? Given what I just said, which is you're going to liquidate the company and sell it in the marketplace today. What do you think your mission is? Value or price these pieces? Aum, what do you think? I mean, since you want to sell the uh, assets today, your time horizon is really short, so you'd use pricing. Absolutely. 
liquidation valuation should really be called liquidation pricing, right? Because you do an intrinsic valuation, nobody out there might be willing to pay that number. Liquidation valuation is mostly pricing. What about accounting value? I remember 20 years ago when accounting was writing its fair value rules, they had a panel meeting in New York and uh, the one, one of the people in the panel called me and he said, would you be willing to come in and talk to our panel? Because you know, we know your valuation, this is about fair value accounting. We'd like to hear from you. And I said, are you, are you sure you picked the right guy? Because you know what I think about accountants, right? He said, no, no, we're, no we'd, we'd love to hear from you. I said, okay, so send me what you're thinking about. And they sent me the statement called FAS 157. I told you accountants think in terms of rules. So, they, they're one, so this was FAS 157, the rule that still governs fair value accounting. I'm going to paraphrase what FAS 157 says. And then I'm going to ask you the same question about accounting that I asked you about liquidation. In FAS 157, here's what the accounting rule requires you to do, to attach a number to an asset based on what market participants, that's exactly the way the rule is written, would pay for that asset today. In other words, I wouldn't attach it. So in fair value accounting, you're asking me to attach a number to every asset based on what a market participant will pay for that asset today. Jake, do I have a value mission or a pricing mission, given that I want to attach a number based on what a market participant would pay today? Oh, that would be pricing. Be a pricing mission. That's exactly what I, I said. I'm very confused. I said, why isn't this called fair price accounting? Why are you calling it fair value accounting? And they said, what's the difference between value and price? And this is why I think we get into trouble. Because around the world, this creates a huge amount of frustration for accountants. I remember getting, um, you know, getting a call from from the accountants had been called in to Fidelity, where Fidelity was asked, this was when Uber was still a private company and Fidelity owned about a small slice of Uber. And the accountant's mission was to attach a fair value to that holding because you know, they required to mark it up to fair value. The, the, the group of accountants calls me and um, they said, look, we're running into some trouble. And I said, what's the trouble? They said, we have to attach a number to this 2% of Uber that Fidelity owns. But the problem we're running into is with our discounted cash flow models, we can't even get close to the number we'd like to see. And I said, what's the number you'd like to see? They said, we know what the most recent VC investment in Uber was. It was a Saudi investment fund. We know they paid 61 billion. 2% of 61 billion is, is 1.2 billion. We want to get at least 1.2 billion. But with the DCF model, we're getting like 300, 400 million. I said, he said, you know, the question I had is, what are we doing wrong? And I said, we're not doing anything wrong. Your mission is a pricing mission. You want to come up with 1.2 billion. The problem is the accounting rules require you to do a DCF to back that 1.2 billion. That's a wrong end game. Until fair value accounting resolves this contradiction you're going to see this frustration play out because you're telling accountants to price things, but you're asking them to back the pricing with a DCF. Either require people to just using pricing, multiples and comparables, and let it be a pricing or call it fair value accounting and let it be a true intrinsic valuation. You can't have a pricing mission and have a DCF back it up. And finally, let's talk about some of the parts valuation. As I said, you know, the, in recent years, many activist investors have targeted multi-business companies for a very simple reason. They believe that the sum of the parts is worth more than the company as a, as a continuing going concern. And in some of the parts valuation, one of the few cases where you could argue that you want to do an intrinsic valuation of each part, because each part is going to be spun off as a going concern. You want to get a sense of what's each going concern going to be worth. Now to do some of the parts valuation, your company has to help you out, right? It has to give you information on each part, not just on revenues, but on operating income, capex, depreciation, all the things you need to do a discounted cash flow valuation have to be av available at the level of the parts. So I'm gonna take you to an example from 2009. It's actually, I, I'll send you the link to this paper as well, it's called Valuing the Octopus, Valuing Multi-Business, Multi-Geography, Multinational Companies in Parts. 
a company called United Technologies. You might be familiar with the company, but in 2009, I described it as a poor person's GE. GE, of course, in 2009 was still in 20 plus businesses. United Technology was in six businesses, very different businesses. In fact, some of the names on the list of these businesses are familiar names, you might've heard about them. The first was a division called Carrier, which made refrigeration systems. The second is a business called Pratt & Whitney, which was a defense company. The third was a division called Otis that made elevators. The fourth was a division called Fire and Security, which is a security business. The fifth was a business called Hamilton Sunstrom, which is a manufacturing company. And the sixth was a business called Sikorsky that makes helicopters and aircraft. Six very different businesses, all part of United Technologies. The one nice thing in valuing the, the parts with United Technologies, they gave me information on every business. So this came right out of their 10K. They gave me revenues, EBITDA, pre-tax, operating income, CapEx, depreciation, total assets. Items you won't find for most companies broken down by part, but they broke it down for each of the businesses. So I said, I'm gonna, you know what? I'm gonna to try to both price the parts and value the parts. Let's, do with the, let's start with the very simplistic pricing. If I gave you this information on the six businesses, oh, by the way, they also said there was $408 million in corporate expenses that were unallocated. For the moment, just set it to the side. But let's suppose I gave you these six businesses and the breakdown, and I gave you five minutes to do a pricing of each business. It's the most simplistic way to price the businesses. What did you do? You take a metric, you know, presumably revenues or EBITDA, then what are you gonna do? You're gonna look at the multiple of that number that companies in that business typically trade for, and you're going to do a back of the envelope pricing, right? Let's try that. Here's what I did. I took the EBITDA for each of the six businesses, I looked at the median EV to EBITDA for other companies in each of these businesses, which I had in my industry averages. And then I just applied the multiple. So if you take the carrier business, 1.5 billion EBITDA, I multiply by the median, I get an estimated pricing. You add the numbers up, the value that you get with a very rough pricing is 61.7 billion. You think that is so simplistic. Most analysts, when they talk about some of the parts valuation, this is all they've done is they've applied a multiple based on other companies in the sector to number like EBITDA or revenues and added them up. When I do this, what am I saying about each of these businesses? That each of these businesses is like the average company in the business, right? That carrier is like the average refrigeration company. Pratt & Whitney is like the average defense company. What am I not controlling for? That these businesses might have higher growth or higher margins or lower risk than the other businesses. So I tried to do a more sophisticated pricing. And here's what I did. Rather than have to use the same multiple for each business, I actually used different multiples. I used EV to EBITDA for two, EV to revenues for two, and EV to invested capital. So how did you pay? Nick asked me, you know, and uh, what, what would I use as my multiple for Israeli stocks? I said, I'm going to try five different multiples and pick the one with the highest R squared. I used all of the, I picked the multiple that I had the highest R squared. I, I avoided the equity multiples because you don't want to go the equity route when you're summing up the parts. But I had the choice, EV to sales, EV to cap. I tried all three for every sector and I picked the one that had the highest R squared. It turned out that in two of the sectors, EV to sales worked best. In two EV to capital work best, and two EV to EBITDA work best. These are regressions, so I can plug in the values on return on capital, tax rate, and margins into and I get a predicted EV to sales for each of these businesses. It's a little more sophisticated, it's still a pricing, but think of it as an advanced pricing. I've brought in the differences in the divisions. And with if I plug in the numbers for each division into those regressions that I got. I get a predicted pricing adjusted for differences. The value that I get is 74.2 billion. What was it with the simplistic? It was 61.8. You're saying, why is it higher? Because it turns out that United Technologies refrigeration division has higher margins than the typical refrigeration company. This allows for those differences. So it's a pricing, but it's a little better in terms of adjusting for differences in my company and the rest of the market. With both these pricings though, there's a loose end I did not tie up. Know what that loose end is? Remember that $408 million in corporate expenses that's hanging out there? I'm acting like it's gone away, right? 
It's, it's part of the company. I'm acting like it's not even there. That's a common problem with some of the parts pricing is people ignore these corporate expenses, which can often be in the billions of dollars for a big company and act as if it's all going to disappear the minute you break up the company. And it's not because it's a shared cost. It's going to go back to these divisions. So now I'm going to try to do an intrinsic valuation of each of the parts. So to do an intrinsic valuation, what do I need? I need cash flows, I need a cost of capital, I need a growth rate, I need, a, I need everything that I need for a DCF, right? So let me start with the number that I think is the number that'll be easiest to get for each of the six businesses, at least based on how we've approached getting this number. I estimated a cost of capital for each of my businesses. To get a cost of capital, I start with an unlevered beta for each business. So the nice thing about the way we've computed cost of capital is we now have a template for getting a cost of capital per division. I did apply the same debt to equity ratio for all the businesses because they're all infrastructure manufacturing businesses. I ended up with cost of capital that ranged from a low of 6.78% for the security business to 9.94% for Otis, the elevator business. Very different cost of capital because they have very different risk profiles. Now to get the cash flows, I started by looking at my key metrics. Are these good businesses? And remember how we measured good businesses? We looked at what kind of returns they made. And based on that, here's what we get. The return on capital varies across my businesses from 6.03% for the security business, that looks pretty crappy, to 35.7% for the elevator business. It looks pretty good. You look at the reinvestment rate again, wildly different across businesses. I now have the cost to cap for each of these businesses. I also have a return on capital and reinvestment rate for each business. Now, if you remember, return on capital times reinvestment rate is my expected growth rate. So think of these as five, six different DCFs kind of rolling on different tracks with different cost of capital, different growth rates. In fact, in five of these divisions, I used a high growth rate because the growth rate was too high relative to the growth of the economy. For security, I just put it into, into stable growth right away. I end up with six different DCFs with six very different sets of cash flow growth and risk characteristics. Here's the bottom line. With those assumptions, I get a value for each. These are intrinsic DCF valuations of each of the six businesses, the sum of those intrinsic valuations is 80.25 billion. So basically I've done a DCF for each of the six parts, added them all up. What's the loose end though? There's a $480 million corporate cost that has to go somewhere, right? And yes, I've brought it in. Oh, four to eight million net after tax, because it's tax deductible, assumed to be a growing perpetuity has a value of 4.6 billion. I'm gonna act like that expense is gonna continue it's gonna drain my value because even if I break these businesses up, the accountants have to go to those businesses, the cost is still going to be there. The value that I got by netting it out was 75.7 billion. That's my sum of the parts valuation of United Technologies based on each business and bringing in the g and cost. In fact, earlier I did the pricing with the just multiple seven. That's actually remarkably close. The pricing and the DCF give me very close values. I also did a traditional top-down valuation where I looked at the whole company, the value that I got was 71.4 billion. Let me ask you a question. Let's say you believe these valuations. By taking the company and breaking it up, I'm arguing that it's gonna be worth 4 billion more than it is as a combined company. That's the sum of the parts valuation giving you a direction. In fact, the bonus here, the stock is actually trading at 52 billion. That gives you even more buffer to work with, right? It doesn't need to have to be broken up. It's just massively undervalued. But basically I've taken each piece and given it exactly the same treatment I would if you had a whole company. Any questions? Now, I visited GE about three years ago and decided to give them the same treatment. GE two, three years ago was in serious trouble. It wasn't the GE from 2008, this massive conglomerate. So basically I broke them down into eight businesses. Notice I've given them different shades. I have three yellow businesses, three green businesses, two red businesses. 
using what's with the colors. The three green businesses, the businesses where GE is now earning well above its cost of capital. Think of them as good businesses. The two red businesses are disasters, right? One is lighting and the other is capital. And oil and gas is very close to being a disaster, but for the moment, I'm gonna give them the benefit of the doubt. The yellow businesses could go either way. They're kind of neutral businesses. This is the problem of being a multi-business company, right? You have good businesses, you have neutral businesses, you have bad businesses. What's your first reaction? Get rid of the bad businesses, right? How the heck are you going to get rid of GE capital? It's entangled with everything else you do as a company. This has been GE's problem for the last few years is they know that GE capital is an immense drain. They finally managed to get rid of it this year, but think of how much it's entangled in everything else the company does. In fact, based on uh, some of the parts valuation, the value that I got for GE, this was about three years ago, was $10.92 value, each piece separately, netting out the debt. So doing everything you do after you got the sum of the parts, you still have to add the cash, subtract out the debt. But I've, so I can value GE the traditional way, but here I've just valued the pieces separately. And just to check, I also did the sum of the parts pricing of GE, where I took each part of GE, applied an EBITDA multiple, and the price, some of the price, the, some of the parts pricing is about eleven eighty four. Stock was actually trading at think eight dollars eight fifty when I did this. Now I bought GE. It's not been a completely unimpeded rise to the top. This stock dropped as low as five and a half dollars. Right, it's had its really bad days. It's now towards the upper end of the spectrum. But I think for GE, until it figures out what to do with GE Capital, how to clean up for the the debris from GE Capital. It's gonna be really difficult to kind of take off and become a standalone company. Can you do this for any company? Absolutely. In fact, a little later in this class, I'm gonna value a user. You know, at Uber, a rider at, a rider at Uber, a subscriber at Netflix, an Amazon Prime member. You can use this technique at any unit level you want. Intrinsic value is additive. You can do it by pieces. You can take a multinational and take each geography and value it separately. The mechanics don't change. It's still cash flows, growth, and risk. You know what your biggest challenge though is? You need the information at that level. And companies are not very good about breaking down information at a level where you can value each piece separately. So when people ask, why don't you do this for every company? First, I'm too lazy. Second, Getting the information on the parts is really, really difficult to do. This is an information challenge, not a valuation challenge. There's no theory issues involved here. Just remember to take care of those, those un unallocated costs because I've seen it ignored too often to let it go. It can be billions of dollars for some companies. It has to stay in the game. You have to value it and net it up because if you don't do this, you'll systematically overvalue companies when you do some of the parts valuation. Any questions on some of the parts pricing or valuation? Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, my, my question is basically, um, do, it's kind of to do what I said in the chat is, is there any place where like this, like this business where you say that if you always do some of the parts here, the, oh, let's say this, type of conglomerate is there let's say a heuristic way to... to figure out when something is being mispriced relative to its parts yeah you could probably look for its you know the easiest way is the combined pe ratio but the company is probably going to low so it's when you start to screen multi-business companies and you see companies trading at horrifically low pe ratios a lot of family groups in india like the godridge which is a very old indian family group company trades at four and a half times earnings you say why is that that's usually a trigger that something is going on in the group that investors don't trust. So I would say start with that. Look for usually older companies, multi-business companies that trade at low multiples and then start to break them up to see what the reason is. Because if it's one bad business, maybe you can get out of it. Thank you, Professor. Okay, folks, I'm going to wrap up for the day because it's a little early, but I don't want to keep going. We've been through a lot of slides today. So, you know, I want to give you a chance to go back and review the slides. And if you got your DCF back and you want to make a couple of tweaks, go ahead and make the tweaks behind you. Tim? 
uh, Professor, uh, since we talked about a lot of different approaches to, I don't know. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, since uh, we talked a lot about, you know, different approaches to uh, valuation, um, and I'm just, just curious, like, how would you, how would you value a digital infrastructure like is the if same we way. talk about different approaches we talked about only two right you can value yeah, yeah. something or price something yeah yeah and within each you might have some ways of saying you know with value can you do you value the whole or do you value the pieces mm -hmm. with pricing it's a which multiple do i use so you have a digital platform you're going to try to value the pricing that's the first choice you have to make pricing will be based on what will somebody else pay for a platform which might be based then it'll be based on number of users number of people on the platform but if you want to value it, what do you need to do? You need to estimate the cash flows you can generate from owning the platform, right? So presumably you can do you know, three different things with the platform. So you'd have to estimate the cash flows. I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm saying that, that with valuation, there's no way around it. It's got to be cash flows, growth, and risk, no matter what asset you're valuing. Okay, so, so um, what I did for digital infrastructure was that I, did it till the terminal value is zero? Like, would, would it be wrong? Because it's, because I thought, you know, it would be applicable since infrastructure, we usually do DCF till the terminal value is zero. But so I use the same tactic for the digital infrastructure. Would that be wrong? Not necessarily. If you think technology is a fading asset, which means it has life, but at some point in time, the technology mm -hmm. moves on. It is a finite, it's, a, it's really a question of finite life versus infinite life assets, right? Finite life assets, you have a period of time where you can make lots of money, but at the end of the point in time, you just shut it down and walk away. There's no, not even a salvage value. It's like having an oil well, right? As yeah, long yeah. as there's oil you extract. And a digital platform, you're arguing, is more like an oil well than it is a beverage company, which mm. means once you've extracted what you can, you've got to move mm. on. The one okay. thing, though, is what you get out of a digital platform is users and subscribers. Mm. And they can outlast the technology, right? So if you're Netflix, even though the basic way in which you deliver movies might change over time, you have a, you know, almost 200 million subscribers. And if they're attached to you as a company, you might be able to move them to a different platform. So one of the arguments you can make is your advantage as a company is not the platform, but the people on that platform. And they're more sticky than the technology so they can keep, so, so that's one argument for why platforms can have going concern values. Those users and subscribers may stay with you even uh -huh. as you shift technologies. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, folks, that's it. And I am going to stop sharing and see you on Wednesday. Thank you, uh, Professor. You're welcome. Yep. I had a question. Um, Go ahead. When are you going to release the uh, the material for quiz three? Release, it's already on there, right? If you go to my website. So if you want to get there ahead of time, just go to exams and quizzes on the web page for the class. On the website. Okay. Quiz three, yeah. So if you're asking when will I actually send out an official statement, it's all, it's, so all of the quiz reviews and the final review are already on the web page. I just sent an announcement saying, do you guys want to go check it out? So go to the web page for the class, click on exams and quizzes, and you should be able to see the quiz three stuff. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Professor. Daniel? Go, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I just wanted to ask about the valuation. So uh, now that we did the intrinsic value part, what's required yeah. after that? The pricing. So that's just a regression? Yeah, for example, pick a multiple and regression is only a piece of it, right? It doesn't, you might end up not using a regression if it doesn't work. You still have to do the pricing, right? You have a peer group, you have a multiple. You've got to tell me how much you pay for the stock based on what other people are paying for similar stocks. Okay. And there are templates for that, right? Well, the, it's data. There's no template, right? Basically, you've got to go to Capital IQ and download the data. So it's really the bulk of the work here is not building. It's not like an intrinsic valuation where it's building on some theory. It's just building on what the data tells you to do. Right? Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Hey, Daniel. Yeah. Uh, hi, sir. Sorry, I had a few questions. Uh, one was about the DCF. 
yeah. I mean, I used the spreadsheet that you provided in one, uh, one of your emails, the one that you said is mm -hmm. the most extensive, extensive one. Now, uh, the way we, we calculated reinvestment was using that ratio that you provided. We, we assume a ratio, sales to, exactly, yeah. sales to capital. Now, PayPal, with respect, I'm doing PayPal, by the way, with yeah. respect to its other uh, peers, it has a very weird structure where it does a lot of buybacks and it's growing a lot with respect to sales. So okay. I, I was assumed, I mean, I was, I was thinking it would be a better, there would be a lot of better ways to basically um, do the reinvestment. So I was thinking of other models that you have on your website. You got to link so, it to something else, right? I mean, it, 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 what, what can you link your reinvestment to? You can link it to sales. You can link it to operating income. What else right? can you link it to? I, I was I was thinking because they do a lot of acquisitions and capital expenditure maybe. But that's they, I mean, capital. So basically, sorry. that's still the same. I mean, so that's just the denominator. Uh huh. Right? You have to decide right. what do you want to link the invested capital to. So there are only two choices: you can link it up to revenues, you can link it up to operating income. Okay, makes sense. Makes sense. Right. I, 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 my question would be: Can I use uh, some parts of maybe this spreadsheet? And that specific part from another spreadsheet of yours, but what's just to calculate part, the what's reinvestment. What's the other part from the other spreadsheet uh, you use? I, I, I use only two ways yeah. of getting reinvestment. One is to connect it to revenues. The other uh -huh. is to have a return on invested capital, which is to connect it to operating income. There's only oh, okay. two numbers I mean, you can connect yeah. it to, right? There's nothing else. So when you say you want to use a combination, do you want to tie it to your operating income, which can actually be more dicey than tying it to revenues because in your acquisitions have to show up as an immediate operating income jump. And that might not be the case. The reason I tie to revenues is the rawest form of growth, right? I don't have to wait for the income to show up. I just said, look, you do an acquisition, your revenues show up. So that's why I've linked it to revenues and it's actually the most direct and the most general way of estimating. But the only other choice you have is operating income. There's nothing else you can link it to. Okay, sir. Thank you, thank you. Another question, sir, with regards to our group. One of our group members, we were a group of four, and one of our group members has, I think, left the class. Uh, I just it's got a fine. message from it's her. Okay. Even, and, if you, even if it makes your group uh, incomplete because you lost your money, yes. losing confidence, don't worry about it. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to let you know. But thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your advice and uh, uh, review. Thank you. Welcome. Angela? Hi, Professor. Um, I think you gave me feedback on my DCF, and I think you said my basic inputs don't make any sense. So I think I'm valuing Kroger, and it's like a grocery company and a cash cow. So I thought like the, because due to the pandemic, like um, their sales increased like dramatically for this like uh fiscal year, but I was thinking like because um, the pandemic's almost over that they would go back to like their usual like 5% growth a year. Do you think that's okay for me to like, I think you said it didn't I make sense for me to- I think the growth was issue. Tell me what you assume there's margins with that. What, um, what do you assume will happen to margins? The margins yeah, didn't change very much in 2020, even with COVID. It's not like the margins jump. My, I think the point is I saw your margins drop off dramatically in 2021. That's not going to happen at Kroger's, right? It's a grocery store. I mean, it's not like you're selling high price goods. They didn't push up prices during COVID. You're still getting... So if there's anything that happened, it might have been... A, it's not even a huge surge in revenues. It has 7% growth rate instead of the usual 3%, right? So don't overestimate what COVID did to a company like Kroger. It's not like what it did for DoorDash or what it did for a company like, like Instacart where the, the surge was immense. For Kroger, it was a higher single digit rather than a lower single digit growth rate. And its margins really didn't jump up. So don't be adjusting the margins dramatically in 2021. It's not gonna drop margins substantially. It's not gonna become this money losing company. So I think you gotta be careful not to overreact and adjust those numbers. And the best way to do it is look at what it was in 2019, 2018. My guess is you look at margins in 2020 and margins in 2019, they're not that different. The revenue growth might be Great. higher, but the margins are pretty similar. Great, Professor, thank you so much. And then one more question, yeah. um, just for um, my long-term growth rate, can it be the same as like the near term 10 years since yeah. it's- um, The long-term growth rate cannot that, exceed your risk-free rate. That's your only, only constraint, right? So basically that's the thing about perpetual growth is you can't let it be higher than the risk-free rate. For a company like Kroger, you might already be close enough to the risk-free rate in terms of growth that it's not going to be a big change. Oh, sorry, Professor. Then 
on that note, I got a risk free rate for 1.71%. That's where you're going to end up in, in perpetuity. But for the long, when you say long term, are you talking about years through um, two through five or beyond your 10? And or, uh, the 10 year T bond. So I will try to make a um, growth. So I, I think you should move towards a 1.71% over time, please. Oh, sorry, Professor, can you repeat that again, please? I lost connection. In, in, in a perpetual growth rate, the perpetual growth rate should be about 1.71%, the growth rate after year 10. So that's all that's going to, so what you do over years two through five will be up to you, but it can't be a really high number. It's a company that's a mature company. It's not growing that fast. So eventually it's going to become 1.71%, but what you do between years two and five, I'm going to leave up to you, but it's not going to be a high number. It's not going to be double digit growth. It's not going to be negative growth either. There's going to be no drop in revenues in 2020, 2021, even though COVID might be behind us because it's a grocery store. You're not going to get a 10% drop in revenues. You know, people might be coming in and sort of shopping online, but the, the, you're not going to see huge jumps around in the growth rate or margins for a company like Kroger's. Okay, great. Thank you, Professor. So just a uh, long-term growth rate, okay, if it's risk-free. Uh, It'll automatically do it. You don't even have to do a thing. It's set to be, you know, so it's the default. It's already set to do that. So you don't even have to touch it. It'll just go to the long, to the risk-free rate. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Louis? Uh, wait, Brian, did you have a question? Yeah, it wasn't important. So you go first. Okay, I have a question, uh, a little little bit tangential to class. Yeah. Um, so I'm working on like a side project, professor, uh, and I'm working on trying to value something that's it's not a business. It's like valuing maybe an individual uh, that's within a certain industry mm -hmm. and valuing their future cash flows. Do you have advice? Like, have you ever done something similar to that, or do you have advice um, on like how to kind of begin doing something like that? I, I valued um, who was an NFL quarterback from Houston who decided to. Adrian, Sean Watson. I'm sorry. Sean, Sean Watson. No, no, no. This is way back, ten years ago. I'll, I'll send right. you the link to it. Basically, I valued his present value, future earnings. The, the two things to remember when you value a person is people don't live forever. Don't use perpetual growth models or the cash flows. There's a finite life, and or, so you got to think about how much of a remaining lifetime do, do you have as a person to earn income. And the second thing you got to factor in is uh, what exactly is the end game? Are you trying to decide how much to pay for this person or it's kind of, it's kind of comes awfully close to slave labor if you're buying the person for the present value of their earnings, but uh, what exactly was the end game? Why are you attaching a value to a person? So the reason I'm doing this is because I am, it's kind of like a broader concept that I've been kind of developing where you've got high profile athletes that are mm -hmm. in high school. So and that, then I think that then I can understand. So basically you're, in fact, who is it that signed with the San, San Diego Pad, Padres a couple of years, just a year ago for what, 400 million? He had actually entered an agreement with the agency that signed them where he got money up front in return for giving up, I think 20% or 15% of its earnings in perpetuity. So there are businesses out there that try to do it. And that's a much more, and there actually the lifetime becomes even more critical, right? Because you're looking at a professional athlete, you're not looking at even the rest of the lifetime, they're looking at the rest of the playing lifetime. Like one of the mistakes I made when I valued this running back was I estimated a remaining life of eight years, but he was 29. And the NFL running backs by the time they're 29 are so beaten up that they're looking at three to four years. Um, right. So if it's a traditional athletic contract, it's going to end when the athlete kind of retires. But if it's somebody like a Shaquille O'Neal, where you're going to be able to earn money as a celebrity, as a movie actor, then it stretches on. And there will be, you know, Peyton Manning, for instance, makes more money now than he did as an NFL quarterback, because he has this extended life as a celebrity. So I think the tricky thing is not the mechanics of doing it, but drawing out what you mean by earnings what shit so I, I would say if you can if you can estimate the earnings that an athlete can make and that will require judgments about you know where they are in their career what they will be paid what they will make as ad rev you know from advertising etc on the side 
then you're well on your way to valuing. Let me send you the, the, the blog post I did on valuing the NFL quarterback so you can see the process yeah, be, and play it out. I think I'd be kind of more valuing a basket of athletes where you take the top couple, you know, let's say high school basketball players and in the country, and you know, two or three of them traditionally every year hit it big and make a right. hundred million over the course of their career. And there were other seven do virtually nothing. Yeah, that, that makes it even easier, right? Because right. it means that you're looking at a group, a portfolio of athletes, and you don't have every one of them to pay, but it'll depend on how well you put that portfolio together because you need one or two or three of that portfolio to pay off for your overall portfolio to deliver value. Right, right. So yeah, well, could, I, could I see your evaluation? Yeah, of absolutely, that? I'll send it. In fact, it was part of a business that was started where this business was going to do this on multiple athletes where they would trade um, an upfront amount for 25% of the earnings that that athlete would make in, in, over the rest of their lifetime. And it, cr That's it crashed because it turned out that there was an agency issue, which is if you gave up too much of your income as an athlete for an upfront, mo upfront money, you also lost the incentive to go out there you know, because you're going to have your earnings already. So you don't, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to pitch that extra inning. You don't care about that contract as much. So they actually had a trouble expanding the model, but I don't know whether they're still around. You might be able to find them as well because they were designed yeah, to kind of do exactly that. this. Because that's, that's similar to what I'm, what I'm kind of working on uh, right okay. now. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll send, I'll send you a link and you can see whether. Uh, it, yeah, it be, are you sending it in the chat or are you? Uh, no, I'll send it to as an email. Yeah. Was that um, much auto, Professor? Who signed that contract like that? I'm sorry? Air, you know that, Arian, uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Brian. I'm, I'm talking over. Uh, for the Padres, was it Manny Machado who signed that? Like, no, no. Manny contract? Machado, this year, well, who did they sign for $350 million? Oh, it was, uh, was it Tatis. Blake, uh, no, was, was it Tatis that they signed to a $350 million contract? I think it was Tatis. Take a look at what, uh, you know, because he actually, when he was 18 and he was desperate for cash, signed with this group and this group is doing exactly what Louis, uh, you know, Louis suggested, which is to take a bunch of 18 year olds. So they didn't even have to do it in high school where you didn't have a sense because baseball, it takes a while to actually figure out, but they're just a really good high school player with your, so they took 18 year olds who were in the minor leagues that they knew had lots of potential and they actually offered them a deal of $3 million up front, which to these people looks like a ton of money, right? You've never got this much money in return for 15% of your signing contract when it happens. And they hit it big time at the T's because I think for 3 million, they got back you know, 35 million. But that's what Louis is talking about, of get, getting, getting, getting those, those hits. So I think it's gonna become more common over time I think the legal issues are still going to have to be ironed out as to exactly what it means. And the agency issues will always be there because you can't ask for too much of a slice because then you've given up you know, much of the incentive for that player to go out there and try to get the biggest contract he or she can. Yeah, I think you you definitely probably have to cap it at probably 10%. Um, yeah, I would say 10% or 15% would be the maximum you can go for. Right. Not to mention the fact that the PR doesn't look great because it's going to look the ones you hit on, you look so greedy, right? Because nobody thinks about seven other players you signed that never made it to the major leagues. They say, you paid what to get what? So when they look at this, this sounds like it's ripping off the athlete. So as a business, it's actually very difficult to fight that perception that you're somehow ripping off athletes. So You've got to be very careful about how you present your successes and failures from a PR standpoint to continue to do this over time. But I think it's a, it's a business that's going to get bigger over time. And then, yeah, yeah. It's, uh... And um, last class, you asked if I was a Yankee fan, but I didn't have my volume on for some reason. So I'm not. I'm just curious if you're a Yankee fan. You love baseball. I'm a Yankee fan. Okay. Okay. Good. I see a Yankee cap, so that's why I asked you whether you're a Yankee fan. Yeah. 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 Definitely Yankee fan. Okay, that's have all. You I to, have you been to any of the? Have you been to? No, I haven't have you been yet. Able to go to any of the games yet? There are about twenty percent capacity or something, right? Oh, one of these days I'll be back in this Yankee Stadium. Yeah, that's what I'm looking forward to. Also, hopefully soon. Take care. All right, appreciate it. Take bye -bye. care. Bye bye. Thank bye. you, Professor. Bye bye.